Thank you so much, Mike. Um, uh, thank you also for the slight promotion. I'm only an assistant professor, a small but a very important distinction, I think. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, a couple of things. The first one is that um, I tend to walk around a lot. And so on the Zoom, if you can't hear me, please shout out and, um, and Mike could let me know and I'll stand close to the computer. The second thing is um, if you have questions during the seminar, I think it's a nice group. We should definitely just ask questions as we go, as you think of them. I find it boring listening to myself talking for 45 minutes. You guys probably will too. So interruptions are welcome. Um, and the third thing is thank you so much for the really warm and lovely welcome that I've received today. It's been absolutely wonderful visiting the university and, um, and I hope I can visit again in the future. It's been so nice. So today my talk is about uh, merging supermassive black hole binaries. And the question of if there's a disk there, how does the shape of the disk change this process? But I want to, before we start, I want to take a short uh, detour, a little sidebar, as it were. Most of my work at the moment is actually focused on protoplanetary disks. And we had some really exciting results come out last week that I'd like to share. And this is about the protoplanetary disk TW Hydra. So TW Hydra is this poster child of protoplanetary disks. It's bright, it's nearby, it's old, and we can observe it really easily. And in 2015, my collaborator, John Debus, had a look at this disk. This is the flux um, in the face of the disk. Apologies, the scales on the far right hand side, but lighter here is representing a higher flux. And the important thing to take from this image is that in the top left hand corner, the disk is a little bit dimmer. It's not quite as bright there. And this is pretty interesting in of itself, but um, because we have so much data about TW Hydra, John made the effort to look back in the historical, in the archival data we have to see if that pattern, if that feature was there as well. And he found that not only was it there, you still have this dimness, in the top left hand corner, but it's actually moved ever so slightly. It's hard to see in these images, but between 2015 and the 2016 observations, this feature, this dimness actually moved around the disk. And he calculated that it should do, based on that speed, it should move, um, it should do one full rotation every 15.9 years, which is very quick for this kind of a feature. And the interpretation was at the time is that there's something in the inner part of the disk where we can't resolve in this, in, this, in this little black region here where we're covered by the coronagraph and everything, we can't resolve that region there, that there's a misaligned or some kind of a part of the disk that's warped or has some funny geometry, which is actually blocking the starlight and casting a shadow onto the outer disk. And the shadow is moving with the speed of this thing that's going around in the inner part of the disk. So this is interesting enough in, in itself, but then John made the extra effort to ask for some more observing time to see how this thing would change over time, this thing that's casting a shadow into the outer disk. And this is the very exciting result that we had come out last week, was that in the 2021 observations, what we found was not only is this shadow feature still there, but it's actually split into two. These are now labeled by the letters B and C. And although it's a subtle feature, it's a bit hard to see, we now have two shadows. And this became really interesting. So you have this thing that's casting a shadow in this disk and it's changing, it's moving, but it's also potentially splitting up. Or maybe there were two things that were overlapping before and they've now become distinct and resolved. So our interpretation for this very recent observation is showing schematically on the right-hand side here. We interpret that this shadow feature in TW Hydra is probably caused by two misaligned inner disks. And these two disks are misaligned in different orientations, which cast two different shadows. And in the past, there's a possibility that these two things may have been overlapping. On the left-hand side, these are the flux profiles, a different radii in the disk with the ones down the bottom being closer to the star in the center of the disk. And the left to right, this is showing you around the top face of the disk. And the squares here are representing the actual data from the 2021 observation. And in the orange line, we're showing a basic interpretation that only requires one misaligned ring. And the point of our 2023 paper was to show with radio transfer modeling that the red line, which is created by using two misaligned disks is the minimum you need to recover the kind of features that we see in the flux, pro the flux profiles for this disk. So the really exciting thing for me as a kind of more junior researcher um, is that John organized a fantastic press release that came through NASA. And, um, and we made news last week in quite a few places, including Yahoo News. Um, as a researcher, my family don't understand what I do at all. But when my family found out that I was featured on Yahoo News, I had suddenly made it. So there you go, that's the benchmark for everybody. 
But um, it was fantastic to see um, this science getting out there and being um, in, and engaging with the public on this. So that's TW Hydra, and I'm happy to answer any questions about TW Hydra as well. But today's talk is about supermassive black hole binaries. And we're talking about the merger of these supermassive black hole binaries. And so the first thing, if we want to merge these these black holes that are residing in the center of galaxies, the first thing we need to do is to actually merge two galaxies. These snapshots here are showing some observations um, uh, explaining this process of having two galaxies come together and then eventually through dynamical interactions, through tidal stripping, all this kind of thing, eventually in the last panel coming down to one galaxy. And the presumption is that each of these galaxies to start with had their own supermassive black hole. So by by the time you get down to the end here, you've got one galaxy, but there's two supermassive black holes bumbling around and bouncing around in there. And so the question then becomes, well, how do we bring these supermassive black holes that are bouncing around in this one galaxy close enough together to actually merge? And there's a bunch of processes that we can invoke to do exactly this. Here at this figure, they're scaled by the distance between the supermassive black holes. So we've got the galaxy merger on the left-hand side here, and on the far right-hand side, all the way down to coalescence, where these supermassive black holes are actually going to merge. And the first thing that we have here at large scales, we have effects like dynamical friction or something to do with features in the galaxy, so the presence of a bar or something like that. As we get to smaller scales, so about 100 parsecs, to, sorry, 100 parsecs to about one parsec, we have these other effects coming in. So the potential of disk-driven migration, and that's what we're going to focus on today, so I'll talk a lot about that, as well as things like having a second binary disk with mini disks. So for example, you have your two black holes, they're surrounded by a disk. How does the presence of that disk bring those two black holes together? as well as other effects. And then we get down to, at 10 to negative two parsecs, we begin to get into the gravitational wave regime. And this is where um, facilities like LISA will be able to detect the merger of these supermassive black holes. So as I said today, we're going to be focusing on this disk-driven migration. And so the idea here is fairly straightforward. We have your two supermassive black holes. Eventually, we want to bring these two close together. But the presumption is the assumption is that one of these supermassive black holes has some kind of an accretion disk around it. This is reasonable. These are supermassive black holes. At some point in their lifetime, they should have accreted material. So there's likely to be at least one accretion disk in this picture. For the purpose of today's talk, I'm going to say that the supermassive black hole that has the disk is the primary black hole. The other one is going to be the secondary. And you can see from the frame of reference of the primary that the secondary is in orbit around the primary. And we can classify the components of this system for the purpose of today's talk, just using the angular momentum. So for our primary black hole, the most important angular momentum consideration here is the spin vector of this black hole. If it's rotating in this sense, it has a spin angular momentum straight up the page like so. The secondary black hole also has spin, it's also rotating, so it also has spin angular momentum. But from the frame of reference of the primary, the most important thing is the orbital angular momentum of the secondary, the vector that describes how that secondary is orbiting around the primary. The third component of this system, the disk, that also has angular momentum. Um, and perhaps the most important thing to take from today's talk is that the angular momentum of the disk is allowed to vary as a of radius. It's free to do so. We expect the magnitude to change as a function of radius as you go out in the disk based on um, uh, the re relationship between angular momentum and mass, we expect it to increase. But we're also going to allow the direction to change if it wants to or if it needs to. Now, the problem with the diagram that I've drawn here and the way that I've sketched it is that all of these vectors are parallel. I've just motivated to you that we can get to this scenario by having the merger of two galaxies and then dynamical processes bringing these black holes even closer together. And so if you have this chaotic process, this violent process bringing these black holes close together, there's no reason to expect that all these angular momentum components are going to be aligned with each other. There's no justification for it, actually. What we should expect, the more general picture, is something more like this where everything is allowed to be misaligned, is allowed to have its own orientation. And the most important angle here is the angle theta that I've marked in gray. And that shows the angle between the primary spin angular momentum vector and the orbital angular momentum of the secondary. In other words, theta is the angle between the spin of those two black holes, okay? And introducing misalignments 
causes a teeny tiny problem. And that is that as soon as you have misalignments and the presence of black holes and the presence of a disk, you induce external torques on the disk. And those external torques can have dramatic consequences when it comes to the evolution of this accretion disk. So let me explain what I mean. Let's think about this primary black hole here. The primary black hole is rotating, its spin angular momentum is straight up the page, well, slightly off straight up the page right now. The fact that it's rotating induces lens tearing processional frame dragging, right? This is a, a gravitational, sorry, not gravitational, this is a general relativistic effect. And that, that frame dragging in combination with viscosity acts as if to pull the inner edge of the disk into alignment with the primary spin um, vector. And so if you're the accretion disk, the inner edge is being torqued into alignment with the spin vector of the primary black hole. By a similar token, by a similar argument, the secondary also has a similar kind of effect. It exerts a tidal torque onto the outer edge of the disk. But the effect of the secondary black hole is to try and pull the outer edge of the disk into alignment with the orbit of the secondary. So if you're the disk, the inner edge is being pulled into alignment with the spin of the primary, and the outer edge is being talked into alignment with the orbit of the secondary. And I've just um, tried to motivate to you guys that these things, there's no reason for them to be aligned with each other. And so the orientation that this disk takes is actually a really difficult question. It's being pulled literally in different directions. And so we have two main research questions to think about in this context. The first one is, what shape does the disk take? Can we make a general argument for what we expect the disk to look like in these kinds of merger scenarios? The second research question is this, how does the shape of the disk whatever we find it to be. How does that shape affect the alignment of these black holes? That angle theta between the primary and the secondary black hole, that's something that can be inferred by Lisa. I'm not an observer, but this is what I understand, that this is something that can be inferred by Lisa. And so that angle theta becomes really important and the evolution of that angle theta becomes very important because it's our observational prediction that we're going to work towards. And so the second research question we have here is trying to understand, well, how does theta evolve in the, the presence of these misaligned torques and the competition between these misaligned torques. To answer these questions, um, I'm presenting work today that is a summary of three papers in the series. Um, and so uh, I'm leading paper two, but I'll note that Davide de Rosa was um, the main champion of this work and he's involved in all three of these papers. And so let's go through these one at a time. The first paper, the BP effect, the body and Pedersen effect, in accreting supermassive black holes, a systematic approach. May I just ask? You sure can, yes. Yes. Um, so are, can we assume that geometrically retaining issues we are talking about here? Um, for, the, limited to that or it for the purpose of um, the discussion, yes, we limit them to be fairly geometrically thin. It's a really interesting question though, and I will come back to this because in paper number one, this is a really great question. In paper number one, they assume the disk is infinitesimally thin. And in our calculations, we explore aspect ratios of 0 0.03, 0 0.05, and 0 0.08 near the inner edge. And so that's not particularly thick by any stretch of the imagination. But even so, with that level of um, disk thickness, we're able to, to find a difference between the 3D simulations and the 1D analytic model. So this is an important question. Um, does, your, does your question come, sorry, can I ask why you asked your question? Sure. And so <laughs> I'm trying to see whether we have different um, equation mechanism going on, whether we would end up what you see or what you could present today. Yes. So that will depend on the viscosity and the aspect ratio, I assume. Exactly. So those numbers are quoted later on. And yeah, we can talk about that later. Absolutely. Fantastic question. Cool. All right, so paper number one. Um, this paper is looking at an analytic approach, a semi-analytic approach. So there's a little bit of maths to come, but don't stress about this. Um, in the semi-analytic model, David DeRosa and collaborators wrote down the equations that describe the evolution of this accretion disk between these two supermassive black holes in terms of the radius only. This is a 1D approach in the sense that everything is parameterized only as a function of the radius. The top equation here is showing us the evolution of the surface density profile, where sigma is the parameter, the surface density profile. It shows you the mass distribution in the disk. The second equation, that slightly longer one, that's the evolution of the angular momentum. And remember that this is allowed to be as a function of radius. The angular momentum in the disk is allowed to change as a function of radius. Most importantly in this description, um, Davide, Drosa, and collaborators included the terms from 
the primary black hole, the, the torque exerted by the primary black hole that causes the inner edge to align, and the torque from the um, secondary black hole that causes the outer edge to align with the orbit of the secondary. In this particular form, these equations are not numerically tractable. So Jerosa et al. made a very clever change of variables, and then they use these existing time scales that are showing the box on the right hand side, RLT and RTID. That stands for the lens tearing radius and the tidal radius. And we're going to talk about those in a second. And so what they did here is they solved these two equations, just showing the evolution of the surface density profile and the angular momentum profiles to see how these disks evolve and how they change over time. So they made use of these RLT and these RTID, uh, the tidal radius here. And the way to think about these length scales is that these are the length scale at which these effects are strongest at shaping and changing the shape of the disk. So at the length steering radius shown in the green box at the top, this is the distance from the primary black hole where the disk shape is most strongly affected by this torque. And the same for the tidal radius. The very new thing that David and and collaborators did was they introduced this convenient parameter called kappa. Now, kappa is important because all of the subsequent results I'm going to show you are parameterized by kappa. So it's really important for us to understand exactly what this parameter is telling us. It's the ratio between these two length scales. And so the first thing you notice is that it's a non-dimensional number. We can, however, write at kappa in terms of the parameters of the system. And so the first two terms here, they relate to the primary black hole. The secondary, the second two terms, they relate to the second black hole. And the third terms, uh, sorry, the last three terms on the bottom line here, they're all disk parameters there. And so this entire system, the, the primary black hole, the secondary and the disk between it, all those parameters go into this calculation of this number kappa because kappa is a ratio between two length scales it also has a physical interpretation conceptually kappa represents the importance of the secondary black hole on the evolution of the disk so for very large values of kappa that means that the secondary black hole is dominating the evolution of the disk and the primary black hole is almost negligible by the same token for very low values of kappa the primary black hole is the most important. That's dominating the evolution of the disk. And the secondary is not important at all. And in the limit that kappa is zero, the secondary doesn't even exist. Now, here, I said that one of the important things is that kappa is a non-dimensional number. That means that later on, when we're doing our 3D calculations, all we need to do is get the right value of kappa. And we should expect the same physical behavior. OK, so Jerusa et al. They modeled, they started with their two supermassive black holes and a disk between. They chose the parameters to describe this system. They then cal calculate their value of kappa. In this example, kappa is 0.1, which tells us that the secondary is moderately important in the evolution of the disk. They then take those equations that I solved you for, um, sorry, those equations that I showed you for the surface density profile and the angular momentum profile as a function of time. And for a range of different initial inclinations between the, uh, the primary and the secondary black hole, they then solve as a function of time for the angle that we expect between, between those two black holes, right? They solved for the evolution of theta. And what you can see here is that for the starting values, can I do this maybe? Yes, cool. Um, so for the starting values here, these are the different inclinations that they start with. Over time, you can see that everything moves towards being coplanar. And in a way, that's kind of expected, right? Disks are viscous. We expect everything to kind of damp back down. This is unsurprising. They also solved this system for retrograde misalignments as well, though. Retrograde initial, um, initial misalignments. And so here, these are the warm colors at the top. And you can see, again, that everything kind of moves back down towards coplanar, towards prograde coplanar. Um, perhaps the most interesting results from David Edros's paper in 2020, however, was not the results that I'm showing here. Perhaps the most important result was actually when they found no results at all. In this gray box here, shown in their figure, the semi-analytic model that David Edros was using, and collaborators, sorry, uh, it broke down. Practically speaking, the integrator stopped integrating. For whatever reason, they were unable to find solutions in this gray region here. And you can see that this is problematic because the warm lines here from the retrograde black holes, it looks like they're trying to move down through this gray region here. And because their, um, their solution broke down, you can't tell what's going to happen next. They also can't start with a disk that's perfectly perpendicular, which is an interesting question in and of itself. 
but they can't start with that because that's in the region where there are no solutions. So this was for a particular value of kappa, so a particular combination of the parameters of the system, and for a particular alpha value. DeRosa and collaborators then repeated this experiment um, for a range of different kappa values, which is shown across the page here, for a range of different inclinations, and a range of different viscosities, which is shown by the different colors. And the gray regions here, the shaded regions here, is showing you where their semi-analytic model broke down. Right. So for an alpha value, so for um, an alpha value of 0.3 inside this region, so this shaded region here, this is where the solution was unable to comment on what was occurring. They call this angle between this this boundary between where the semi analytical semi analytic model worked and where it didn't, the angle of criticality. Okay. And outside of this region, they were able to show that the disk evolves in a fairly straightforward manner. Um, and they were able to calculate the, the evolution of the angle between the, the two black holes fairly simply. So the question then becomes, well, what is going on in this region where the semi-analytic model breaks down? What does this angle of criticality, what does that represent? What is actually occurring here? And can we confirm this result physically? So this is where uh, myself and Rico Ragusa uh, came in to the picture. There's actually, I'm sorry, there's... Somebody's missing from the citation. Um, Giovanni Rizzotti is also on this paper as well. My apologies. Um, so what we did was using the phantom smooth particle hydrodynamics code, we ran 3D hydrodynamic calculations trying to understand what's happening across the full parameter sweep, the full parameter space, sorry, um, described by DeRosa et al. So in other words, the parameter space that they have up there, <clears throat> where their semi-analytical model breaks down in the majority of the parameter space, we decided to cover that with as many different 3D calculations as we possibly could. For our 3D simulations, we ran 143 different combinations of binary separations, of different disk viscosities, of different aspect ratios, different starting inclinations, as well as different kappa values. And so in other words, different masses between the mass ratios and things like that to get different kappa values. Um, one of the things to understand about our calculations, in order to run this many calculations, we had to make some simplifying assumptions. And one of those is that we use a post-Newtonian approximation. Um, so uh, the, the general relativistic terms, that frame dragging term, we don't use full GR to describe that. Instead, we just use a post-Newtonian approximation. And it's a fixed one. So that essentially means that the primary black hole is not allowed to move in our calculations. To respect that assumption, we set the mass of the primary black hole to be much, much larger than the mass of the secondary. But because kappa is a non-dimensional number, we have the freedom to do this, right? As long as we end up at the, the right kappa value, it kind of doesn't matter how we got there. So we can set the mass of the primary to be much larger than the mass of the secondary, and we can tinker with, say, the aspect ratio or the separation between the two black holes, so we get the kappa value that we need to cover their parameter space accurately. Of the 143 calculations that we run, uh, we essentially found, broadly speaking, three different outcomes. So let me show you what these are. In the left-hand panel of each of these simulations, you're looking top down on the disk. The primary black hole is at the center here. It's not marked by anything, but I promise you it's there. The secondary black hole is marked by the blue dot on the right-hand side. And in the right-hand panel, you're seeing the same thing, but the disk is, is side on. You're looking at the edge on view. And the first behavior that we find is what's known as just warping. So here, the shape of the disk, the angular momentum of the disk is flat, changing the function of radius. And what we find is that you get this curvature in the disk and the disk orientation changes. We also see really clearly these beautiful spiral arms in the outer edge of the disk. And this is due to the interaction with the secondary black hole. Okay, so warping, it's kind of okay. The geometry has changed, sure. The second kind of behavior that we find is known as this breaking or this tearing. This behavior has been seen in simulations before. This in itself is not anything new. But here, what, what occurs is when you have your disk and you apply the external torque with the right set of parameters, the disk is fragile enough to break into distinct and uh, disconnected disks. And so here you can see that this disk is actually breaking multiple times into multiple rings. And each of these disks or rings that have broken off, they're allowed to process effectively independently. 
independently. And because the precession driven by the primary black hole is strongly as a function of radius, the innermost ring processes a lot faster than the material at a larger radii. And so as a result, you get this really interesting geometry with opposing parts of the disk really naturally occurring. Okay, so that's disk breaking and disk tearing. And in, in some of our calculations, we find it like this, where you have multiple rings ripping off across the course of the simulation. And sometimes we find only one ring breaks off as well. Okay. The other thing we found, and for, to our knowledge, this is the first time that this has been identified in 3D calculations. We found an example of unsuccessful breaking, what we've called unsuccessful breaking. And so here what we see is that the disk is showing us all the symptoms that it's trying to break, particularly if you look at the right hand panel here, you can see that we have an inner ring that looks like it's just about to snap off. In the, um, the top down view here, there is a, a decrease in the density that is very suggestive that the ring is trying to break off, but no matter how long we run these calculations, the disk never actually separates, it never actually snaps off successfully. And so here we find, we call this unsuccessful breaking. Um, and as I said, to the, our knowledge, this is the first time that this has been recovered in 3D calculations. So for 143 simulations, we have those three broad outcomes. And I'm gonna split them into warped disks, unsuccessful breaking, and then breaking with either one ring or breaking with multiple rings. And here you can see that we can categorize these using the surface density profile, and I'm gonna introduce here the warp profile. So these, these graphs here are showing as a function of radius um, with the left-hand side being close to the primary black hole. The middle row is showing us the surface density profile with the initial surface density profile shown by the dashed line. And so you can see that in the case of the warp disk that we find just viscous evolution of the surface density profile, it's incredibly boring. But when you get to the right-hand side, for example, you can see that we have these oscillations. Those local minima are showing you where the disk has broken. That's where you have these breaks, this separation between the disks. In the case of one panel to so the left of that, in the case of the single breaking, you can see we have one local minima that tells us that the disk is broken. In the case of unsuccessful breaking, there is a local minima, but it's, it's not that deep, right? It's, it's still kind of connected and it never really gets much, deep, much deeper than that. In the lower row, we also have this warp profile. So um, the warp uh, from a kind of a mathematical perspective is how fast the steepness of the disk is changing, like how, how quickly, how steeply the curvature is changing as a function of radius. It's given as the radius times by the rate of change of the angular momentum as a function of radius, right? How steep is the disk changing? And what we found is that in disk, where there's warping, that the, the warp profile is zero. That's also boring. But whenever you have evidence of disk breaking, so on the two right-hand sides, you get this steepening of the warp profile. And some work by Suzanne Doan has shown us that when you have steepening, it's incontrovertible that disk breaking is occurring there. In the case of unsuccessful breaking, there is kind of a steepening of the warp profile. You have a local maximum, but the magnitude of that does not increase over time, it just decreases. And so that's how we know that the disk is never going to break no, no matter how long we run it because that wall profile decreases over time. So we write a little, uh, a little script that looks at all of our calculations and categorizes all 143 different simulations into these four different outcomes. And the next job we have then is to compare to the semi-analytic model from DeRosa et al. 2020. And so I've recreated their figure here. We've got kappa across the page with um, a small kappa, so uh, less important secondary on the left-hand side, and a, a large kappa, so it's a more important secondary on the right-hand side. And up the page here, we have our different starting inclinations between those two black holes with a perfectly um, a perpendicular black hole in the middle of the page. The colors here, again, are representing the viscosity and the shaded regions is where the semi-analytic model breaks down. We're gonna go through these parameters kind of one at a time because there's otherwise there's just a lot of points really, really quickly. So for an alpha of 0.05, here we're focusing on the red lines. These are the results of our calculations, right? The squares, down, let's start down the bottom. The squares down the bottom are showing us that the disk is warping. So the very small inclinations, we get that warping behavior, curvature of the disk. As you move up to higher inclinations, particularly for the, set, the data set on the right-hand side, you can see that as we approach that line, that angle of criticality, that we start to recover disk breaking, right? 
as we cross into this region where the semi-analytic model, semi model breaks down, the disks show evidence of breaking. That's true all the way through, past retrograde, all the way through to the higher inclinations at the top, where we return to warping as we cross that line of criticality. The left-hand data set is not a perfect match, I absolutely agree, but let me take you through the rest of the data first. Okay, for um, a viscosity of 0.1, we see really similar behavior, right? If you start at low inclinations, outside the angle of criticality, we find disk warping. As you cross that line of criticality, we find evidence of unsuccessful breaking at that boundary between the two. And then as you continue into the region where the semi-analytic model breaks down, it's just disk breaking time and time again. And so the punchline here so far is that the semi-analytic model breaks down when disk breaking occurs. That angle of criticality separates us from a region of disk breaking and from a region of disk warping. We see the same thing for viscosities of 0.15. In particular, that data set on the far right-hand side produces a really lovely match to, to where we go from, um, where we cross that angle of criticality. Okay, so far, moderately so good. Not perfect matches, but certainly we're recovering the qualitative behavior, and sometimes we get a really close match as well. Then we get to our high viscosity case. So this is an alpha of 0.2, and the region of criticality for this particular data set is, it's really narrow, right? Most of these disks should just experience warping according to the semi analytic model, and we recover that. But <laughs> The region, there are some data points that have got, that are kind of superimposed, and even inside the region of criticality, where we expect is breaking to occur, we don't recover that in our 3D calculations. So that's point number one. The second point is these ones I've just put on the left hand side, these squares um, at very low kappa, and these are our simulations with aspect ratio, uh, an aspect ratio of 0.08. And for these disks, we expect there to be disk breaking for quite a few of them, and we don't recover disk breaking in any of these whatsoever. So the important thing is that, broadly speaking, we do agree with the semi analytic model from DeRosa at all, but there are regions where we disagree. So let's talk about those really quickly. The first one of these high viscosity disks of alpha of 0.2, right? And so this is interesting because we expect the semi analytic model to work really well at high viscosity. Um, and so it's a surprise to us that it doesn't. But what we discovered is this, we compared the surface density profile as a function of radius for a high viscosity disk shown in purple and a really similar, uh, a, a disk with similar parameters but a lower viscosity shown in green. And you can see the surface density profile of the disk shown in green has that local maxima that tells us the disk breaking has occurred, right? This disk in green has a ring of processing material that's going around the inner black hole, the primary black hole. And if you have a look, the, the maximum that you have near the inner edge, that's representing the density of that inner ring. And, but the inner edge of the purple line is very different, actually. The steepness there is quite different. And what's occurred is, for those high viscosity disks, remembering that viscosity relates directly to your accretion rate, right? The higher the viscosity, the more material is being accreted onto the primary black hole. And so what's happening is that high viscosity disk, it's accreting so much material that there's not enough there to break off. You can't just break off like one little parcel of gas. You need to break off a chunk, basically. And with this high viscosity disk, there isn't enough, a large enough chunk to break off. And so we don't recover disk breaking even when we could expect to. The second uh, limitation that we have with these larger aspect ratio disks, so they're the green and blue points on the left-hand side. And here, again, uh, we ruled out everything else. We ruled out numerical resolution. We ruled out if we're in, in the wrong disk regime, all those kinds of things. And the conclusion here is that there's a limitation for the semi-analytic model that assumes the disk is infinitesimally thin. It's a razor thin disk in their, in their model. And in our 3D calculations, that's not the case. And so the thicker the disk gets, the further we get away from the assumption, the more likely it is that we recover disagreement between these two. And so for the parameters that we chose, this, is, this disagreement is manifested in aspect ratio of 0.08. Um, and so uh, here we've identified a limitation of the 1D model in that if the disk is very, very thin, we get quite good agreement, but the thicker the disk becomes, the weaker the agreement. Yeah. Shoot. Choice of kappa includes mass ratio as well, right? Yes, yeah, it does. So is it controlled by the mass ratio or some other parameters for a combination? 
that put it at the value. Yeah, it's a combination of everything. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, but I, but I was wondering whether if it's too small, if the, the, the secondary one, then you would have to do this. So, so the max ratio for all of our calculations is the same. Okay. We have to have it as the same because we're trying to respect that assumption of the fixed post Newtonian potential for the binary, right? But this is an interesting question in the sense that, um, yeah, sure, you would expect maybe for a really, um, a really big difference in the mass ratio that the disk won't be broken. But the fact is that it is actually for all of these calculations, right? The disk breaking depends on the kappa, which is the combination of all of those. So as long as you get the right kappa, it doesn't really matter what mass ratio you choose. Yeah. Okay. So, um, the next thing that we discovered in these simulations, again, what we believe has occurred the first time, is that we found a local disk feature that can determine whether the disk breaks or not. So normally when we're doing this calculation, is the disk going to break, is it not going to break? We look at global parameters like the communication time scale and the torque supplied to the disk. In this case, in these simulations, we have those fire alarms due to the interaction with the secondary. And what we found is that in certain simulations, under certain conditions, the warp profile propagated from the inner part of the disk to the outer part of the disk. And when it hit the spiral alarms, the warp stopped. What looked like a disc that was moving towards breaking, moving towards separation, the warp hit the spiral arms and it just decayed away and the disc remained stable and did not break. Now, our interpretation is this, that in the presence of these spiral arms, we know the viscosity is going to be slightly higher. And when the warp reaches a region of slightly higher viscosity, the higher viscosity stabilizes you against breaking. And so the warp is killed. It decays at that point. We tested that by running two calculations. The top one on the right hand side, this is showing us an example where we have really strong spirals in the disc. And when the warp hits these spirals, it does not break. It stops. The warp is killed. In the bottom panel on the right hand side, we have the same simulation, but we move the companion out slightly further. And so the spiral arms are weaker. And in the presence of weaker spiral arms, the disc does display evidence of disc breaking, and it is trying to break at the location of those spiral arms. And so I want to emphasize again, this is to our knowledge, the first time that a local disc feature, something like spiral arms, some structure in the disc is able to stabilize the disc against breaking. And this is not this is not recovered in the semi-analytic model, let me be clear, because the semi-analytic model assumes that the disc is actually symmetric. It doesn't take into account any of these kinds of features like spiral arms. The other thing that became really interesting is this idea of, okay, this is breaking, where is it breaking? And what radius is it breaking? And how important is that? In 2009, Rebecca Martin and collaborators made a prediction for this scenario. If you have these two supermassive black holes and a disk in between, and there's some kind of an inclination in the picture, where is the disk going to break? And the most interesting thing about the prediction from Rebecca's uh, work is that it doesn't depend on the viscosity at all. So we think about disc breaking as a competition between the external torques. It's the competition between the torque provided by the primary black hole and the torque provided by the secondary. And where these two things are equal, where they're, where they're kind of equal magnitude, you might expect the disc to break, right? And she showed that if you take the ratio of these things, the viscosity, like, it just drops out. So the fact that the disc breaks does depend on viscosity if the disc is going to break at all, but where it breaks does not depend on viscosity. We measure the break radius across the course of our simulation. So this is time um, on the x-axis here and the break radius that we've measured on the y-axis. And we scaled it by her prediction, hoping that we would be able to, to confirm her prediction. And you can see here that we are way off, right? We only get up to about 60% of what she said the break radius should be. Um, but you can also see that the break radius is changing across the course of our simulations. These points aren't constant. They are continuing to evolve. And so it could be, the discrepancy here could be that our simulations are just not run for long enough, right? These are really expensive calculations. To run for an extended period of time is, is computationally is very, very difficult for us. Um, but perhaps also there's just something more that we need to understand about this description of where the disk is going to break. Um, interestingly, we also recovered that in all of our calculations, if a disk breaks prograde and retrograde, that the retrograde case breaks at a slightly larger radius, even though the semi-analytic model would have you believe that they should break at the same radius. And the discrepancy here, the difference is the direction of the torques, the direction of the spiral arms. That's what breaks the symmetry. 
Okay, let's return to our research questions, right? Our research questions were, what shape is the disc tape? The answer to that is the disc can be warped, the disc can be broken into two, two rings, it can be broken into many rings, or it can be unsuccessful breaking somewhere in between those two kind of categories. The second research question was, well, how does this change the evolution of the angle between the two supermassive black holes? How does this change this angle of theta? And so the evolution of theta, the cos theta dt, can be given by this expression on the right-hand side. This is a bit of a, a word salad, but this is the rate of change of the angular, the unit vector of the angular momentum, spin angular momentum of the primary dotted with the unit vector of the orbital angular momentum of the secondary. Basically, the dot product between the unit vectors of the green and the pink vectors, right? Okay. Now, the important thing is that the j hat dt can be expressed by this summation here, this integral here where this is the, you know, the, the evolution of theta fundamentally is driven by the back reaction of the disk onto the primary black hole. So we have this term here with J cross L, which is the cross product between the spin angular momentum of the primary and the angular momentum of the disk. But remember that the angular momentum of the disk is a function of radius. So when we do this integral across from the inner edge to the outer edge, if the disk is warped or flat, the angular momentum, broadly speaking, has the same direction as a function of radius. So when you do this cross product and then the integral, the summation, it's always going to be contributing in the same direction. It's either going to be positive contributions all across the disk or negative contributions all across the disk, right? But if the disk is allowed to break, and if part of the disk is allowed to process effectively independently, and if you're allowed to have opposing sections of disk, when you do the summation of J cross L, L is not always going to be in the same direction. And so the contribution to the summation terms of this integral sometimes will add and sometimes they will cancel out. So in the event that you have just breaking this integral, this cross product here, dj dt, dj hat dt, should change drastically, which means that we should expect to change with d cos theta dt. Now, our simulations, I've mentioned before, one of the limitations is they are short duration. These are computationally very expensive calculations and modeling them for a really long time is just prohibitive. And that's why DeRosa et al, their approach was a semi-analytic model. That was the, the feasible way to do it. But what we can do from the disks that we have, from the simulations we have, we can demonstrate how changing the disk structure can change this summation, how changing the disk structure can change d cos theta dt and the evolution of this angle that we may be able to measure with something like LISA. So across the course of our simulations, this is exactly what we do. The cos theta dt is shown on the y-axis here. And I want you to start by concentrating on the dotted lines. These dotted lines in um, uh, some of our simulations where the disk is warped. There's no breaking, there's no unsuccessful breaking. These are just warped disks. And what you can see is the cos theta dt, it evolves ever so slightly, but broadly speaking, it's kind of a constant value. Now let's take a look at these solid lines. In this panel, the solid lines are representing simulations where the disk is broken into only two regions. So one ring has broken off from the outer disk. And the outer disk itself is fairly stationary and the inner disk is processing freely, right? And you can see that these oscillations that we recover here, they represent the changing of the direction of the angular momentum of that inner disk as it processes. But we're covering that change in the decos theta dt summation term that I showed you on the previous slide. And we can show that the time between the peaks of these oscillations correlates to the precession rate of the inner disk. This is really just the changing of that inner disk, changing of its orientation, changing the back reaction onto the primary black hole. And you can see here that under certain conditions, decos theta dt even changes sign. So it's absolutely possible when the disk is broken to slow down, but also in some cases to hinder and even potentially prevent the alignment of these two black holes. We can play this game for some of our simulations that have multiple rings breaking off, and it looks like a hot mess, but all that's happening is that, that feature you saw on the previous slide with one ring doing its thing, many, many rings doing their things, all with slightly different frequencies, all summed into one. And that's how we get this kind of a picture here. But again, the situation is the same, right? If you change the shape and the orientation, of the disk, the back reaction onto the primary must change, and so that angle d cos theta dt, the evolution of that must then also change. Okay, so paper number three in our series, Nathan Style and Dave DeRosa 2023, this came out earlier this year. I'm only going to cover this one briefly due to time, 
Um, and these guys were looking at the observational implications of that statement. The observational implications of, if you have a breaking disc, DCOS-CDDT changes. This diagram is what I would call loud. So we're gonna go through it together. On the X axis is cos theta one. This is the angle of the primary black hole. And then on the Y axis is cos theta two, the cosine of the angle of the secondary black hole. And the idea of this graph is that if you start with a roughly isotropic population of, of different inclinations as shown by the plus signs in this figure, and then evolve them through time, which is showing you the lines tracing through this figure, you then get to a point with the red circles where these black holes end up. At this point, when you get when the black holes get close enough, the gravitational waves take over. Um, Steiler and DeRosa then model the green lines and the green triangles with this slightly different analytic prescription to model how the spins may change um, as the as the black holes move to actual coalescence through gravitational um, through the emission of gravitational waves. And so the point here is. If you start with the, the plus signs, all these graphs, all these black holes, sorry, are moving upwards and to the right in this diagram. They're either moving to the right, upwards, or both up and right. In the region, in the middle, there's a box, right? In that box, you have black holes where both disks are broken. And so in their analysis, they assume that if the disk is broken, the spin does not evolve any further. So those guys don't change at all. The horizontal and vertical lines represents where you have disc breaking. So if you take a look very closely, um, across the diagram right in the middle, there's kind of a little tunnel, a little rectangle where uh, the black holes are only evolving in one direction. That's because one of the discs is broken. The same thing occurs vertically. There's a little tunnel in the middle as well where they're only um, evolving straight up the page. And that's because the, the, primary black, the primary disc there is broken, right? So in their analysis, they assume that if the disc is broken, the spin does not evolve any further. I think that's a strong assumption, but this is the result you get. And the point here then is that if you start with broadly isotropic, a broadly isotropic population of different inclinations, that you recover distinct subpopulations, right? You recover a bunch up. Can I do this? You recover a bunch up of black holes here where disks, both disks are broken. And so we stop here. And you recover bunches up here as well. And ones down here too, where um, these disks move to one of the disks move to a, sorry, one of the spins moves to alignment, for example. And so the point of their paper was to identify the, these distinct subpopulations that may be observable by Lisa. Okay, uh, sorry. And then <laughs> these are the, the, in the top right-hand corner there where both spins are aligned. In the bottom left-hand corner, neither spin is aligned. And then on the other side, you can see only one of these are aligned. Sorry, I should have put those labels up earlier. Okay, so to summarize our results fairly quickly, Today, I've talked about how the shape of the accretion disk in this scenario of these merging supermassive black holes with disk-assisted migration, how the shape of that disk can change the scenario we're looking at. And when we take into account misalignments, how important that could be. So the first thing is that I presented some results by David DeRosa and collaborators in 2020 with their semi-analytic model. And I showed you with our 3D calculations that we can find, broadly speaking, really excellent agreement with their, with their model. We do find some, uh, sorry, in the region where the semi-analytic model breaks down, we recover disc breaking, and we demonstrate that that angle of criticality is that boundary between where the disc is warped and where the disc is breaking, and sometimes we even recover unsuccessful disc breaking along that line. We do have discrepancies, though. There are regions of the parameter space where we don't agree with, um, with the results, and we've explained these in terms of limitations of either the 3D or the 1D models. We also demonstrated for the first time a local disk feature which can stabilize the disk against breaking. And this becomes really interesting in the scenario where maybe these disks could have these kinds of features, could have spiral arms, for example. What does this mean for their evolution? Um, we also measured the evolution of an angle between the primary and the secondary black hole, decos theta dt. And we showed that although across our simulations, they're far too short to make this prediction on the long time scale, I did demonstrate to you that if the disk is breaking, the picture should change, right? Decos theta dt, it should align more slowly, or in some cases, even be prevented from aligning. And under the assumption that, um, that when the disk is broken, alignment stops, Derosa, Sinal and Derosa in 2023 demonstrated that 
distinct subpopulations should be expected and should potentially be observable by uh, facilities like LISA. And with that, thanks, Mike. I'm done. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, so we've got uh, some minutes for uh, questions. Yes, that was kind of addressed by the rush data, which I was looking at the first property we have is a supermarket festival, which is the same thing as the time scale that everyone just remembered. So mm -hmm. I'm sure that that might be uh, in years to be effects that I've kind of seen from the public just for the really few things to be able to do some more. Absolutely. So just for the purpose of the Zoom, the question was about um, basically a second disc around the second black hole. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it was first it was limiting case for the semi analytic model. And then also for our calculations, it's a limiting case as well. Um, there have been some recent developments with the code we use phantom that would allow us to model this with two disks now, which is really great and something we should definitely explore. Um, but uh, in the third paper, exactly, they do consider the case where both of the black holes have a disk, and so you can see that's why you get it's a very complicated evolution all of a sudden as to as to where the disk should go, where the where the black hole should align to. Yes, um, but I think from the perspective, like how much does that assumption affect our our conclusions? Right, I think from the perspective of the calculations, as it comes down to like the angular momentum balance, right? So if the if one of the black holes has a much bigger disk or it's much more massive or whatever, that one should win out anyway. Under some assumptions, a second disk really is negligible, right? And so I think that's what we were trying to go for anyway, but it's a really good question and it's something that we should explore. We should extend this work to consider the second disk, yes. And I mean, do the disks interact? Boop, boop. Don't know. And that wouldn't be taken into account by a 1D model, right? That's something we can only show in 3D. So it's definitely worth, worth our effort. Mm -hmm. No worries. I've got a question. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you could say a bit more about uh, how Lisa would observationally test this in particular. Uh, would you expect like bimodal distribution or yeah. uh, what sort of uh, quantities would uh, be uh, like help distinguish between populations? Okay, so for the purposes of the Zoom, um, what could Lisa see basically from these? Right, so this is where I say I'm not an observer. <laughs> And so I'm not actually 100% sure. My understanding is that Lisa is able to recover the spins and so potentially the, like, the spin alignment of these things. Um, but that's honestly, that's as much as I can comment on without um, some serious research. Sorry. <laughs> Somebody else may be able to comment. Martin has a question or a comment. <laughs> I have a question. Okay. Uh, so more inspiration from this nice talk. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, I was wondering about um, adding a, a viscosity, how to energy dissipation rate, um, the modeling geometrically thin disks, or there's um, probably um, optical state assumptions, probably too. So you should be able to predict the luminosity and the disk spectrum mm -hmm. at each point of your, um, uh, of your simulation. And we should be able to, to produce, uh, let's say, a light curve or a spectral evolution of the disk. Wouldn't that be useful to know that? It would be wonderfully useful, yes. <laughs> um, and it's a hard thing to do. It's actually something I tried to do during my PhD and we failed miserably. Um, but it's definitely something that is worth doing. What I would say is that um uh, Phantom, it has in the last few years has been coupled with the radio transfer code um, MCFOS. And so this is something that we can absolutely follow up as well. Um, and we do make some, some assumptions about the thermodynamics. For example, these disks are isothermal. We chose that because we were matching the semi-analytic model, which also assumed the disks were isothermal. But it's an important, it's an important question in the sense that um, sorry. Your question is about synthetic observations. I, I haven't forgotten that, right? But in this description of Kappa. Right, we depend so sensitively to the aspect ratio of the disk, right? It's to the power of negative six. And so the thermodynamics and how the thickness of the disk changes, that is actually a big question in determining are these disks breaking or not, I think. And so things like if we could do a more consistent thermodynamic treatment, if we could then also um, uh, make some synthetic observations or light curves, um, these are all things that we can potentially do with MC FOST and we should definitely be exploring. The other thing is um, that if you have rings of breaking material, 
when you have these opposing angular momenta and these rings kind of meet, you have direct cancellation of angular momenta and material accretes really quickly. And so we know in a disk where you have disk breaking that the accretion rate is much higher and it's modulated by the behavior of these rings. And so that would be really interesting from an observational perspective as well, because that should be some variability that we might be able to connect to something, right? Exactly, yeah. And so there's there's that question as well. If if we can model the thermodynamics a bit better, but also like just in general, the, the, the synthetic observations from these kinds of simulations would be very interesting. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. How the squares again, I'm not sure that it's following. So your simulations would not be able to find any constraint to find the problem or no, <laughs> no, they won't be able to. So, I mean, the other thing is that the, the migration that, so the final pass problem, the having a disk assisted migration, the idea is you bring it in, right? In order to actually bring it in, you need, you need um, the, you basically need the secondary to be inside the disk because you need a spiral arm, you need both spiral arms to be generated in order to promote the migration. And because our black hole starts slightly outside, you only get that one from the interaction. And so it doesn't migrate at all. But also the time scales on which it would migrate if it could are much longer than we simulate. So yeah, we can't make any comment on the final passive Thank problem. You. Yeah, yes. exactly, yeah. Thank you. No, you're welcome. I've got one more. Yeah, um, Mike. Can you comment on uh, the extent to which this physics can be uh, applied to uh, but yeah, still objects. Um, uh, <laughs> since, since you uh, sort of detailed in the library at the beginning, is it got to be something analogous, uh, or is it, or are there two differences? Right. So in some ways it's analogous, and in some ways it's completely distinct. And this is kind of cool, right? So this is our, our like our artist's impression of what we think is happening in TW Hydra with these misaligned rings. And the first interpretation is that you have, well, the, the interpretation we had from the 2017 paper was that you had one of these rings and that it was processing over time and the procession is what was causing the shadow to be moving. And in this case, like in the black hole case, the procession is driven by the rotation, the spin of the primary black hole and the presence of the secondary on a misaligned orbit, all that kind of thing. But in this scenario, like what's driving the procession? Serious question? In this case, we invoked a planet on a misaligned orbit, and that can drive the planet is located in this kind of a scenario. The planet is located here at the outer edge of the disk and being on a misaligned orbit, as long as that planet itself is misaligned with respect to the orbit of the inner disk, if it's like misaligned to that, it can drive precession of the inner disk. And so in that case, we had a way to kind of motivate that. With this new observation, we're now then suggesting potentially that you have two misaligned planets, um, which are driving two disks to process, but the timescales here become really difficult and the radial extents become really difficult. And so in some ways it is related because it's like, you know, well, there's still precession occurring, but in some ways it's completely different because we don't have any of the fun things like, you know, lens precession or anything to drive it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 